What is going on? Welcome to a Caleb Sells live stream. I'm very uh, blessed to have a guest, a two-parted guest on the channel yeah. today with the Resale Brothers, Tony and Christian. Uh, I'll let them just pop in real quick, introduce themselves, and then we'll kind of jump into what we're talking about today. All right. Hey, I'm Tony. Um, I am I'm Christian. one half of the Resale Brothers. <laughs> um, and we have been, what's that, full-time reselling clothes on uh, eBay, for about two Poshmark, years. and Macari for about two years now. Mm -hmm. um, and we started off, uh, actually, you want to take away how you started off? He started off before I did, so. No, we'll just start with the reselling. Reselling, we started off basically just buying stuff. We had some shipments we had to order from China. Uh, we're waiting on them to get in. It was kind of when the ports were all backed up. So we had some spare time in our hands. We were doing mainly Amazon at the time. Um, so we kind of were waiting for that. So we started. Uh, I think Tony was the first person he said, hey, all, well, all the credit for online reselling yeah. clothing goes to me. Um, there was a uh, uh, I was at a thrift store and I saw a Levi's denim jacket that was black. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure we could sell this for something. I got it for like ten dollars sold it for 40 something and it was like okay we can do this we can we can sell some stuff it, it so. all started with a jacket yeah, that's our story yeah, it all started with a jacket and then a lot of other bad stuff after that that we bought but yeah, yeah. so we uh we we started full time from the jump because we we had already worked for ourselves for multiple years mm -hmm. um, like amazon yeah, yeah we had some we had some money saved up and it was kind of we had we had time to go through a transition period so we've been full time for that full two two and a half years so uh, last year we did six hundred thousand dollars in sales reselling uh so i would say we're definitely full time for yeah, sure now. yeah 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 and i mean that's one of the big things that we think would be a great topic for us to talk about is the difference between part-time and full-time and what i was talking about with them is i think that they're almost to beyond full-time where they're big building a company and a business that's bigger than just the input and output of themselves you know uh reselling is very linear for most people like even for me like i go and i buy items and then i turn around and I list them and I sell them. And it's a very linear graph. I could, of course, list more items by myself, but I'm limited by how much time there is in the day, what inventory I can find, all those other factors. Uh, but you guys have built processes that can become bigger than just your uh, input, which I think is really cool. And that's why I think it'd be a great topic for us to talk about today. I do want to say, uh, first and foremost, this is very interactive and we want to answer questions specific to your business so uh if you have questions in the chat definitely uh put them in there so that uh me and resale brothers can get a stab at answering those questions and helping you guys uh specifically to your business which is oh, most helpful uh yeah we got some people already in the chat frugal mom of four hello everyone how's it hello. going hello. and bo johnson's here let's go hey <laughs> Frugal Mama Four says, "I have been selling on eBay for 18 years, and I have four kids. FYI, sales stink this week. Mm, I'm practicing yeah. practicing saying stink instead of suck because I have a two year old. So yes, that was so just smart. like little practice in real time. Since well, you're a mom, you can probably understand that Frugal Mama Four. <laughs> yeah, that's the real S word. Yeah, who needs a moderator? Yeah." Yeah, it's just the real. You just process, you just moderate yourself in real time as nice. time goes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, the uh, main thing is what you watch and on TV. It's like, oh, yeah, I can't watch this around her anymore. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Well, I'll give, you, give just like a little brief background of my journey from part time to full time as well, just for some context, because that's going to be related to our topic today. Um, I was working two part-time jobs, not really sure what I wanted to do long-term career-wise. I had tried a few different things and didn't really feel like anything stuck out to me that I wanted to do long-term. Uh, I stumbled upon a YouTube video. I forget which YouTuber it was at this point because I started watching like a whole bunch of them right off the bat because I was like, oh, this idea is so interesting. Mm -hmm. And I was always a cheapskate. Uh, my parents always taught me to find the very best deal, never overpay for anything, always like everything's negotiable, even at a retail store, like never hurts to ask for a better price. And that's just kind of ingrained in my DNA. Yeah. And when I found that you could use that for a profitable business, I was like, holy cow, this I could be onto something here. Um, and I took some items from our personal closet. Mainly my wife had a pair of hunter boots she wasn't wearing anymore and they were completely oh, yeah. like 
destroyed. Mm -hmm. But back in that time, this was, uh, I guess, 2021, kind of after the like crazy everyone became a reseller thing, just slightly yeah. after that. Yeah, yeah. we missed that. Um, <laughs> And I sold those boots on Facebook for 40 bucks. And then I took that $40 and bought a couple more things on Facebook and just kept flipping that money. And to this day, that's everything in my business has came from that one pair of boots, wow. $40 that's flipped thousands and thousands of times at this point. Um, I did $260,000 in sales last year and $280,000 in sales uh, the year before as oh, wow. a solo operation. So yeah, that's um, awesome. Um, you know, of course, everybody's profit margins are are different on those numbers. So that's not telling the whole story. For sure. Um, but just to give some context, like, you know, I'm fully bought in on this reselling thing as my full time job. It provides all the main income for my family. I have a few other little things that I do to, you know, put some uh, extra money in there. But I'm a full time reseller. That's how I make my money these days. Nice. Absolutely. Love to hear it. Yeah, that's uh. Uh, similar, uh, we, I'm also very, very cheap. Christian spends a little more than I do, but I, I hate spending money and every, yeah, nope. I, mm. I won't, I won't spend anything unless it's a, a Christmas present that I got. That's the only time I'll ever wear, get new clothes or do anything. So it's kind of, yeah, kind of funny. Yeah. Similar. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to uh, catch up on the chat really quick. And then I got made some notes on some topics here for this part-time uh, conversation versus full-time uh, window. Wendy says, hello, everyone. How's it going? I love seeing hey. you in the chat here. Yeah. Window Wendy. Katie says, hello, y'all. Hi. I pull off saying y'all. I just tried it. I don't know. Yeah, that was good. That was good. I believed it. Ohio has a bunch of different accents that you can work in. So. Uh, Blue Acquisition said, just put on my sponge suit, going to absorb as much as I can from you three legends. Caleb, thanks for putting this together. Well, oh, that's awesome. Thanks, very Tom. high praise. We'll try yeah, to live up to those expectations. Praise. Yeah, you're going to be disappointed, probably, uh, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I like to set expectations really low for yeah, myself, so yeah. I never be disappointed. I have a quick, quick question right off the bat. Like, I know you guys were already basically full-time self-employed before you started reselling but mm -hmm. how long did you would you say it took reselling like on ebay or clothing if that's kind of where that distinction would be how long of doing that did it take to get to the point where it was providing a full-time income oh that's a good question go. i think before we get into that exact answer um i think that the thing that really stood out to me as being on Amazon for years and years before moving to the eBay reselling is the margins and the used goods was so much better than the margins were on Amazon. Um, you might make 5% or five to 30% if you're lucky on Amazon in what we were doing. Well, yeah. What he was doing. Yeah. And the difference in that in eBay, as soon as we had our first sale on eBay from used clothing, I was like, wow, we turned $2 into $30 or whatever it was, something ridiculous. And then I was like, if you could scale this, you can make a lot of money with a little bit of money spent. Yeah. So that was kind of like the light bulb moment, so to speak, where we were like, wow, if we just gave this a little bit of effort and see if it scales, then we might be able to make an income just reselling clothes. Yeah. Now the question, the answer to the question was that it took us quite a long time in a lot of trial and error yeah, on yeah, yeah. Uh, how to make everything to where it could be a full-time business. Now, mm -hmm. when we started out, we we have our warehouse, but we only could use half of it. So we had to try to make a way to where we could store everything we needed, trying to find, watch videos to find brands and stuff that was good, um, figuring out where to go, a route to take to buy all the stuff that we were gonna need. Our inventory setup was yeah, completely different. We, we used the bins method and, and, and had, just, I mean, everything that you could possibly think of, right. uh, we did. We do different now than we did then. And so yeah, yeah, starting I, off the wrong way takes a lot of extra effort to fix it as well. That's another. You have to be disciplined to if you see something that's not working and it's not scalable to pivot and make the adjustment. Yeah. So it took us a probably I would say a solid at least a year. year, at least a year before we were like just on the cusp of going to be like a normal, like normal person would be able to go full time. So it was, it took a while. Yeah. So it took about a year. Mm -hmm. I'd say a year. Yep. 
And that's cool. with, and that's with like not having another job and, and not having at the time I didn't have a kid and I was, I wasn't married. So it was literally all of our time went to, so, I mean, in, in theory, it could take probably a little longer, like an, a year and a half to two years for somebody that was, uh, didn't have all their focus and all their eggs in one basket at, at a time. So, um, it, it's, it probably is a year of really hard work. Yeah. Safe to say it could take longer than a year for sure. And you guys had a lot of just e-commerce in general experience. So, you okay. know, that learning curve on its own could be a few months added to that process. Um, right. For me, I started in, I kind of like listed my first things in December, but I say I started in January, 2021. Yeah. And uh, I went full-time in August of 2021. Uh, but I had the benefit of having a very, very, very affordable lifestyle. Um, I, I always recommend that to people. Like if you really want to, you know, go full-time self-employed, like get your personal expenses as low as possible, because that's sure. really the safest way to do it. Because once you live to a certain standard, it's really hard to take your standard of living and decrease it, especially yeah, once you have a family yep. and all those things. So I was very fortunate that, um, you know, I was working those two part-time jobs, like I mentioned. So I was able to first quit one of those. And then I had almost full-time hours to devote to reselling to scale that business uh, while I still had one part-time job. And then um, I probably would have waited at least a year, uh, but the one part-time job I had made like a major change that was going to really affect the flexibility of the job. Mm -hmm. And so they forced you know, I just, kinda. <laughs> I kind of yeah. took a leap of faith. I wouldn't like recommend it for everybody, but because my wife and I's living expenses were so low and Ohio has a relatively affordable place to live. Oh, yeah, um, and little. we had, you know, uh, emergency fund and things like that, uh, which we'll talk about later. Cause I think that's really important for part-time versus full-time and when to make that leap. Uh, mm -hmm. But those things were kind of in place. But as far as like my actual business being scaled to where I was comfortable full-time, I definitely would have waited longer if the circumstances would have lined up differently, but, and that's why it's different for everyone. Like the life circumstances change things too. Uh, you guys were already self-employed. So, you know, going and get a job for you guys would have just slowed down your process of getting this you oh, know, yeah. Yeah. thing up and up and running. So it's right. just going to be different for everybody. For sure. Let's check in with the chat here a little bit before we jump into, it. I keep saying that, but I just think this is such an interesting topic. We could go on for hours here. Sure. Laura says, hello, I live in Dayton and have seen the resale bros a few times at the stores. Oh, cool. thanks for all you do. Yeah, no problem. You see us again. Yeah. Give, give us a shout. Give us a, give us a hi. A shout. Oh, uh, yell, don't, at us. Don't <laughs> yell at us. <laughs> We're jumping. Resale bros, can you talk about your thought process when you decided to hire a VA instead of uh, photographers or shippers? I know VAs are cheaper um, than maybe some of yes. the others. What are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Uh, we already had the VAs hired from our other businesses, so they were already trained. We already knew they were really uh, well-versed in English. So it was kind of a no-brainer to have them help us with the listing aspect because they did listings for us in our other business, just a different platform. So the, the transition was really smooth and easy. And like, like you say, they're a lot cheaper than hiring somebody in the United States. So we knew they were very efficient. Uh, we had a trust, a really good relationship with them because they've been working for us for like nine years. So we had that trust, the trust already established. A trust. Trust. We had the trust established. We so built, we built the bridge. Yeah. So that was the easiest thing for us to hire out because, like, like I just said, we already had them hired. So uh, we basically just had to pivot them to the new reselling business as opposed to what they were doing before. Right. And the 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 software was there for them to be able to um, cross list on everything, and so it made more sense because. Like you said, and I, I hated listing. I mean, taking the pictures isn't bad, but I, uh, it I really helps avoid burnout. Yeah. Too. I am somebody that if there is a section on eBay that says it needs to be filled out, I will fill out every daggone section. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. When they have all those recommended descriptions or whatever. I fill them all out. So it, it would take me hours to do and passing that off to somebody else was my number one goal when doing this because pictures, you can turn on a podcast or whatever and just, that's next yeah. though. We definitely want to hire that out soon. <laughs> yeah. So for sure. And like you said, you already had the employees hired. So whether mm -hmm. they were VAs or whether they were in-person employees, like in any business, it's going to be cheaper to 
keep the same employee and maybe pivot their job description just a little bit because yeah. onboarding is such an expensive cost with lots oh, yeah. of businesses. The onboarding is very expensive with ours. It might not be as much, but you still have the time invested of training, building your own rapport with the employee then uh, you have the trust turnover. that you mentioned. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You could hire somebody and it could not work out and then you just wasted a month and then oh, yeah. you have to go back to taking those pictures mm -hmm. and it, it definitely is complicated. So just the, seems like the, the shortest way to getting it was just somebody you already had hired. So that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and shipping for us is, is easy. It, I mean, clothing in general is an easy thing to ship. So it doesn't take very long. And we made everything. Uh, we, we think we made our process very quickly where it takes us about 30 to 45 seconds to ship an item. So that was something that if we're going to get rid of something, that's going to be the last thing we hire out. So that was, that, that's pretty pretty easy for us to do in the morning it's fun to count money when you ship i made 20 on this i made 10 on this it's yeah. just yeah. made negative that's, on this well, yeah, that's your money pile, pile. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah backwoods pickers says i've switched from doing antique collectible shows to reselling online as a oh, senior so citizen awesome. it's much easier yeah reselling online is great it's a lot less probably traveling around with uh collectible shows yeah, um, you know, the setup and all that. And, yeah. And that main thing, you have millions of customers compared to hundreds to thousands. So yeah. your your uh, customer base opens up a lot. It's huge. Tam says, I'm wanting to move from part time to full time, but I'm still trying to make a cushion before taking the leap. Hey, you're in the right place. Well, We're going to yeah, talk okay. about all that stuff today. So you're in the right okay. place. Yep. Why is it so hard to get views on eBay listings? The items I think are good, public rec. Uh, you were calling this cricket. I was calling it cricket. I don't know. Oh, we're probably <laughs> wrong. <laughs> I just I no was, I, I was firing from the hip and I saw your video this morning. I was like, was I pronouncing this wrong? The it's whole too, day it's the too day? expensive to be cricket. You know what I mean? Like it's got to be right. some fancy. Cricket, right. yeah, yeah. Italian. Yeah. I mean, yeah it's, it's too um, but Annette says it, it just seems difficult to get the views. And what I would recommend is don't really look at the, the, data that eBay shows you on views or watchers, because really if the right person views a public rec pair of pants, it only takes one view. Mm -hmm. If somebody's watching it, that actually means they're not buying it on the spot. So I would rather just have somebody come and look at my item the first time and buy it on the spot than rack up views and watchers on an item. And so <laughs> go ahead. It could also be your, uh, your account. I mean, if you don't allow returns, if you're not a top rated seller, it could be a lot of different factors for why your listings aren't getting views as much as somebody else yeah yeah absolutely so yeah i would start with looking at the views and watchers might not be the most accurate thing um for a specific item because that can be kind of a finicky stat but then i would 100 percent um agree with what they're saying as well um how you run your business is going to affect the sell to rate of your store even if you have a good item uh you know pricing returns photos all those things uh, make up whether someone buys or not. And those are the things that you want to keep improving every single uh, time you do a listing, every single time you take photos. For sure. Shipping time, people look at, oh, they're going to ship this out the next day. Okay, sure. Cool. I mean, it's just, oh, I mean, or, oh, I have three to four days. Mm, I'll probably go with the guy that's going to ship it in a day versus the guy that's going to ship it in four. So, it's, you know what I mean? Yeah, just, we pride ourselves on fast shipping. Yeah, it's <laughs> just it's just little, little things that you can do to tweak yeah. that helps. Blue Acquisition says, when you guys first went full-time, did you have a weekly, monthly budget? Uh, I would love to say yes, but we didn't because we didn't think ahead. Um, we were just like, okay, we can make money selling clothes. Let's go buy as many clothes as we can find because we did have a nest egg saved up. So we, we had um, some flexibility there. And, uh, we had a large nest egg. Yeah, we, we, we think... Oh, we, we act a lot before we think. Yeah. So we will um, go out and just like dive headfirst into a project and then figure it out as we go. Not the best way to do it for sure, but we also wanted to jump on the opportunity. Uh, so uh, we had a really huge death pile. I think we said this on Bo's uh, podcast, but we um, there was a month in December, the first December we uh resold we didn't shop for a whole month because our death pile was that big it was like we, it was taller than i yeah we had a whole month of december where we just listed what we had and listed Pick what we what's had. easy out of this pile that i can do quick. yeah 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 so it was uh after that i would say we were kind of like all right we're gonna figure out what we're doing and then kind of 
But the answer is you should have a weekly yes, slash we have one. Budget. We have one now. We and not necessarily. I don't think we necessarily have a budget at this point. We have. To, we know how much we money we have. We know how much have. we're spending. Yeah. At that, so we're like, okay, we don't really want to go over this, but if we find something really cool, we're not going to like, you know, say no. So uh, we have um, enough of a, a an extra funds in our account that we can uh, splurge a little if we find something that is worth buying. So, uh, yeah, knowing yeah, I think the numbers that's really important. important. Yeah. And going, you know, when you first go full time, I think that that's another thing to consider. Like if you came across the buy of a lifetime and it was five thousand dollars, like if you're full time, you might need that five thousand dollars to pay your mortgage and put food on the table, which I would argue is definitely more important than the buy of a lifetime for your business. For sure. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to let those uh, opportunities slip through your fingers because they happen so few and far between. Uh, so I think definitely having um, a budget weekly, monthly is really important, but also having some sort of, uh, you know, kind of like backup option in case you do come across that deal. Because right. I know for me, I've been waiting for one of those deals for a couple of years now. And when one comes along, I'm ready. I'm, right. I'm ready to, to jump exactly. on it. If you find a truckload deal, we'll go in with you. All right, let's get it. <laughs> yeah, uh, but for me, I think it's more about cash flow. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of what you guys were alluding to as well. Like I know how many items I need to list on a weekly basis now in my business. And I know roughly what that costs me just from the experience of doing it. And so right. for me, I just have to know based on what I got paid out last week, based on what I'm paying myself, based on what all those uh, costs are for my business is, am I in cash flow positive to facilitate what I'm doing? Exactly. And, you know, if I go out and I need 140 items, but I find 160, I need to know that I'm able to do that because that's still a good thing for my business. I don't want to be so rigid. I can only spend this exact amount, but I still have to be cash flow positive in my business. Yeah. Um, so sure. I would say start with a budget, but over time you want to evolve where cash flow is so positive in your business. You're more worried about, am I getting the best inventory, the right amount inventory? And almost the budget for me is the inventory now. It doesn't yeah. necessarily matter what I pay for it. I have to get 140 items every week. And that's where we're at. We have to get, I don't want to say it. Was it? I think it's, it's 540. We have yeah. to get 540 items a week. And um, yeah. it can be yeah, that's not easy. No. <laughs> but uh, once again, like you said, we know how much that about is because every month it seems to be about the same cost average wise. So it, it it works itself out and you know how much you're spending as you go along. But like you said, when you first, especially when you first start having a budget and knowing that, okay, it just depends on your situation where you're at. Like you said, cash flow and everything. So, 100%. Deborah says for sports memorabilia and cards, where is the best place to research? Not eBay, Google, or Worth Point. Worth Point, are there other places to research? I would say, I'm not really an expert on sports memorabilia or cards. I know that that is a category where you can really go like a mile deep. I would say like for me and my business, I'm like a mile wide in most categories, but in clothing, I am very deep in the knowledge. So mm -hmm. with sports memorabilia, if it's not something extremely obvious, I wouldn't even really know where to begin. So at that point, I would try to find an expert if you have a lot of it on a consistent basis that could kind of help fill you in on some of that knowledge or point you in the right direction because researching it without even like a base knowledge can be just such a massive waste of time, especially in that category. Cause there's a lot of that stuff that's worth absolutely nothing. Um, yeah, I don't know it how looks to research like it might be good without using eBay or Google. <laughs> yeah, that's that kind of a, a tough question. <laughs> that was a really good answer that I, I would have just said, if it's not a hat or clothes, I, I, I don't really, <laughs> what a great I don't really know. You know? Oh yeah. Good job. Kid. Great that's, answer. That's, that's, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Deborah. <laughs> Sorry. We don't have any. Info for you. <laughs> Jake says, do all three of you track your hours? If so, how many hours a week do you work? If not, what's your best guess? Uh, I can go first while you guys kind of think about your answer. I would say I'm pretty rigid on 40 hours a week um, just because I have a, a small child and I really prioritize when five o'clock hits, I'm I'm done working. And I really just try to leave it at that. Now that I've added in some social media, like, yes, I might edit a video late at night one night or I might, you know, do an interview during my work day and need to make up a couple listings here or there. Uh, but I would say I'm pretty rigid on my kind of eight. 8.30, 9 to 5 uh, schedule just because I want to, you know, spend the time with my family. 
I know it's very easy to work more hours. And if it, it weren't for my family, I would happily work 60 hours because I enjoy what I do. And I love seeing the progress and I love seeing the numbers go up. I'm like a junkie for that. Like seeing the numbers go up is just fun for me. I don't, I don't shy away from hard work. Um, but my family keeps me in line with that. Uh, and I'm happy to honor that. You want to go your uh, yes, sir. Well, yesterday I worked from 6 a.m. till 10 p.m. So I'm probably not a great person to ask this question. Um, I work. That's not every day. Don't act I, like you well, do every day. I kind of work Don't gas like these until I get the work that I need done done. That's so true. yesterday I had a problem with a virtual private server that my that the VAs use. I had to try to figure that out. So I spent like an hour and a half trying to figure that out. So stuff comes up. Um, I'd say over 60 hours a week for me, at least probably closer to 70, 80. Yeah. You don't think so? That's what you, I don't, I'm not going to tell you mm. what you work. I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, so I was. He's trying to get a pay raise. Yeah, I guess. I don't know what it is. <laughs> we, and, and I we, don't get overtime. We actually never talk about how often we work really kind of no. just, like you said, work till it's done. But ever since uh, I had a baby as well i didn't want to pay for daycare and i wanted to be there to help you know my, my wife still works because she she's a teacher and she wanted to, to keep teaching so uh i watch her during the day so in the morning i'll wake up and i'll go this is probably too in-depth of an answer but i'll go <laughs> i'll go i'll have my mom watch the baby and then I'll can you give me your day. daycare schedule i don't care how many hours you work okay yeah no bring her bring her over it she needs my daughter needs socialization. Um, no, so we'll um, I'll have her watch her and, and my mom watch her and I'll work for like three hours, three or four hours, and then I'll take her home and, and we'll hang out for a while. And uh, I call it babysitting because I don't his answer my, is sixty hours. I don't a week. see myself qualified to raise a child yet, but um, yeah. So we'll do that, and then my, when my wife comes home, I'll go back to work and I'll work until six o'clock. So um, normally it's around six to eight hours but if i don't get enough done there have been times that i've drove back to the warehouse at midnight to finish getting my stuff done so uh, if i don't get my stuff done i come back to finish it at night um so it's not um something where i make an excuse where i'm like okay i had to watch her and this came up this came up i only got 20 listings done today like now i'm coming back in at midnight 1 a.m to finish and, and get it all done so so we don't track. How far do you guys live from your warehouse? Oh, <laughs> that's fun for him. I I live about eight minutes away. Um, I walk down the hill. Yeah, he lives very close. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, he can walk. Yeah, it must be nice. Josh says, "Hey, I'm new here. Welcome." Hey, Josh. Hi, Josh. How are you? Moochie says, "Great collab." Wow. And Thank then you. he says, "Stop the cap on how yeah, many hours stop, you work." Yeah, stop the cap. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sam says, do you recommend niching down inside clothes or staying open to all areas? Do you guys have an answer to that off the top of your head? Um, uh, well, so we, like I said, we do 99% clothing now. But if we're at a thrift store and we see something that is, for, <clears throat> sorry, for sure going to uh, be an easy sale, be quick sale, be good money sale. Be good money sale. We're not going to leave it behind. <laughs> so we'll... Uh, we have a space, so we have like one extra shelf that is for random, random stuff. So every once in a while, we'll uh, niching we'll down is up. good for speed. Like if you're having a problem getting your stuff shipped out, or you're just slow at shipping in general, uh, niching down can be uh, good to just streamline things. Like if you're doing all shirts, I mean, you're just bam slapping a label on that and getting it out the door. So uh, it's definitely good for speed, I would say. But if we see some random thing that you're gonna make ten dollars on, we're not gonna take. Yeah, like we sold a tripod for like four hundred dollars once. So yeah, it was just so something like that was worth tripod. it. Something like that was worth it. But no. yeah, just your normal everyday stuff. No, we're not gonna we're not gonna pick that up. Yeah, over the last couple of years, I've sold a little bit of everything, and when I really was doing that at scale and was doing it really successfully, the shipping became so mm -hmm. outrageous. I would spend entire days shipping because uh, yeah. for the last couple of years, I've shipped every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And in Q4, like I had amazing numbers and the money was really good. But on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I would wake up at eight and I would pack orders and then make it to the post office at like 
Mm, and it just yeah. like really burnt me out quick. And that's kind of what started my uh, deep dive into clothing. Just I was so sick of the shipping, the heavy stuff and the annoying things and the breakables and all that kind of stuff. You don't have your packages picked up? I've never had a reliable situation oh, with mm. the carrier. Pickup. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So back at that time, because the packages were like all like wonky and whatever, like it would be so much they couldn't pick it up on the normal route. So they would just mm. literally drive up to it, look at it, be like, and then just get back in their truck. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we got lucky. Our, uh, we, He's the best. We technically live in a, well, not, I don't live here, but a rural, rural how do you say rural? Rural area. So they rural. get paid different. They get paid by the scan instead of like hourly. So uh, his his paycheck. They love you. Like, yeah, his paycheck's going to like oh, five, man. five or seven grand. I, I was talking man. to him, I believe, two days ago, and he's like, uh, no, it was on. I think it was Monday. I was talking to him, and I think he had like I don't even know how many packages he had. It was well over 150. And he was. Uh, I asked him how many packages he had to pick up today. He said oh, about 280. I was like, so we're over half of your packages for the whole day. Yeah. So he does love us. He loves our. He loves getting the scans. I mean, that's awesome. If you're getting yeah. paid getting paid for it uh, i did have an amazing 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 ups driver where i used to live before my wife and i purchased this house and he would he gave me his personal number and he would like uh communicate with me like if he was going coming early or going late and like one time i he said he was coming early and i didn't have my stuff ready i was like ah oh, don't worry about it i'll just take it and he was like i can swing back later on the end of my route and mm -hmm. so like you you do get blessed every once in a while with a really nice person uh, that, you know, will go out of their way to help you. But you're kind of left, you know, to whatever, whoever you get. Right. <laughs> but talk to your postman. They might help you out. Yeah. Whoever yeah, I, I've okay. considered doing that now that I'm doing more clothing. Before, I kind of understood the dilemma. It's like the guy would literally fill his entire truck. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's yeah that's facilitate like working his normal safe. job. Yeah, weirdly. And so it's like I'm. Thing. Yeah, I'm taking responsibility for that. But now that like even if I doubled my volume, it would be manageable uh, with okay. mostly clothing. Yeah, but I agree yeah. with you guys. Like for me, I, I enjoy playing golf. And so I know roughly what the golf brands are and what they go for. And so like if I'm at a garage sale or flea market or even the thrift store and I see like a really good deal on golf clubs, like I know those sell really fast. And so for me, it's like I use that to kind of fund my hobby um, so I definitely say oh, yeah. don't pass up really good deals when you see them. Um, but there are so many advantages of niching down for me. The biggest thing is I can get so many more items from one thrift store being an expert in one category than just trying to go and cherry pick the very best items. Cause realistically in today's world where there's resellers everywhere and the internet is so accessible, like those items are just so few and far between, but if you can go and get those bread and butter items where the cost is affordable and the, you know, price is enough that you can make it worth your time. Like those items are all over the place, but you have to have the knowledge to know which ones they are, when to go for it and that kind of thing. And that really came from when I became, that really came from when I started focusing on clothing to go a little deeper into the category. Yeah, for sure. All right. <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to catch up on the chat, but I'm having a hard time here. It's a good conversation, though. I like it. Yeah, it's great. Josh says, is there a way to see your initial offer to a buyer? I forget what I sent out. I know it shows you on the computer, but on the phone, it doesn't show you. So I just send whatever offer I would send, and I try not to, like, worry about if they're offended by me sending yeah, a – They get mad. I, for, I forget all the time. time. I forget all the time. <laughs> We get a, so we have a lot of offers normally because we have 11,000 items. So normally it'll, I will have like 15, 20, 25 every hour that we can send out. So I started just sending out 20% every time. And then I know, okay, I sent a 20% offer out for sure. So if I want to go a little more than that, then I know, okay, that's not less than what I sent last time. So, Sometimes I go rogue and just send out random yeah. offers and they get mad. <laughs> Yeah, no, what really I happens, out. What, sorry, what really happens is that uh, I accept an offer that was too low for him and then I get yelled at. That's what really happens most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I send out 10% offers in bulk and I have recently started becoming less aggressive with the offers that I'm taking because I have a decent sell through rate in my store. I'm trying to yeah. just 
get Decent. a couple more bucks here and there. Yeah, yours is good. Um, yeah, you got really good stuff there, right? It's really good. Guys, come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's turning a little red. <laughs> but I can, I can. What I'm saying is, I can afford to lower myself through rate a little bit and make a little bit more on each item. So I just recently, over like the last month, um, before I would say that's one of my tips to having a high sell through rate is being willing to accept an offer. Like if I'm making my ten, fifteen dollars on an item, like am I really going to decline an offer over five dollars? Yeah. Um, and that was kind of the mentality that helped me achieve a high sell through rate. So now I'm trying to find that balance where I'm maximizing profits, not just giving items away. Yeah. And I, I said this on Bo's podcast too. Um, offers and stuff like that. I mean, you got to think about it from eBay's perspective. They make money when you make money. So if you sell something, they make something. So the more you sell, the more in my head, they would want to push buyers to you. Yeah. Because like, oh, this guy's got a high conversion rate. This this girl's got a high conversion rate. They're going to sell stuff if I get the item in front of people. So whether that is because you took a low offer, yeah, but you're going to get three more, four more customers because eBay is like feeding you in the algorithm. I mean, and, that's my thought. I'm not 100% sure on that. Don't quote me. But it makes sense to my and, and small also, brain. It depends on the kind of stuff you're buying. If you're buying all like great 100% sell-through rate items, well, then yeah, maybe you can wait a little longer. But if you're buying like, 50% sell through rate items. I mean, stuff could get your item could get buried in the algorithm and you just never sell. I mean, we have some stuff that's really, really old and it's probably because we didn't accept the first offer we got and we never got another one. Mm -hmm. Especially in like that first two week period. I feel like it's like, I get a lot of offers in the first two weeks of an item being listed. Yep. And then if you don't accept that offer, if it's not a good item, that thing's probably going to sit six months. Yeah. Um, so Hopefully I really, I'm really willing to accept an offer in that first two week period because it's like that hasn't even really like affected the cash flow in my business yet. So if I'm getting paid out before I does that make sense? It's yeah, like it's yeah. so new to my business. I haven't even really felt the hit of that money leaving when I purchased the item. So it's almost like I don't know. If I get that money that quickly, it's worth it to me because it's going back into my business. I can make even more oh, yeah. money with oh, that yeah. money. That's the whole that's the whole whatnot theory that everybody does. It's yeah. Quick sale, get it done, get it in and out, and then you can go buy more. So I mean, if you compare the margins to a regular business, even if you make five dollars on something that costs five dollars, I mean, that's great. Yeah, you make that five dollars over and over and over and over and over again. It evens out eventually by the end. So for sure. Anthony says, Do you guys sleep in bunk beds? Every night. Yep. Sometimes, we've, sometimes we've, I go to the bottom. We've so never we slept cuddle. apart. <laughs> <laughs> AJ says, I would like to get started on a SKU system with boxes to keep track of everything. I think that's a great method. Uh, what's the fastest way to get started Started when I already have items listed about 200? Mm, you guys want to so, jump into that? Yeah, so we literally did this exact same thing, and we just – we had more than 200, but I'm, didn't we just – we went back and edited. Well, we kept the old SKUs and just started fresh, I think. Yeah, we so we renumbered them. We just found them in the inventory, put a sticker on them, and then changed the SKU yeah. in the in the, the listing. So it just, it took a while, but it made everything. Called by the hand, by hand method. So much faster. Yeah, what I did for when I switched from bins to the box method uh, with the numbers, I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, when I switched, what I did was I consolidated all my bins to the smallest amount of bins that I could. Mm -hmm. And then I just started with everything I listed going forward was in the number system. So I still have like one bin in my storage unit that's like items that were that old from like a year ago when I didn't even use that system. But yeah. it kind of saved me the time of going through and manually changing one of those or every single one of those SKUs on those items. Um, okay. So I could do them in bulk because if you sort by SKU on your like bulk active listings on eBay, you can sort by your SKU. So you could select all the items that were in one bin and like transfer that to another bin relatively quickly, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Was that yeah. Clear? Yeah. Sorry, that's I was kind of free ball on that. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, it was a, I think that's definitely a smart way to do it if you didn't want to 200 be, items is manual yeah, you be, be dumb do like that. us we just went okay we're just gonna be re redo yeah, it everything. has to be perfect it took like a whole day <laughs> to redo it all it was great but. we got KM reselling the house uh, hey. i'm guessing this is michael he says if y'all come to dallas i tried to do a little y'all there no, y'all no, come no, to no. ever come to dallas <laughs> hit me up and we shall golf yeah well great i mean reselling channel 
Yeah, for sure. And but Arizona. if we're both in Ohio, then why do we have to go to Dallas? Yeah, you come here. Yeah, he should just come here, hundred exactly. percent. Exactly. We'll fly you out. Also, yeah. All expenses paid. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> but you will pay them when you get here. We'll pay for your driving range balls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it. I live on a driving range, so you can come hit some balls. Uh, and also, I got to give a shout out to Big Yumbo. He's here on his burner. Uh, oh, I don't know nice. if you guys noticed that. It's him with the bunk bed I question. That, I thought that looked like him, but I was like, <laughs> hey, another great, I didn't know that. Another great clothing channel. Um, Big Yumbo and KM Resale. I have interviews with them from the last. A few weeks on my channel. I think both of those are really good conversations. So feel free to go and definitely. check that out after our uh, conversation with Resale Brothers today. Yeah, they're definitely better than us. 100%. More entertaining. <laughs> Traymon says, Do you sell many shoes? If you do, do you ship in boxes or poly bags? Poly bags. And we used to sell a lot of shoes, but we kind of uh, scaled it back a little bit mm -hmm. because. What were you trying to answer the question as fast as you could? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, I like this question because a lot of people ship their shoes in boxes, but I don't really think that's necessary. I don't think it's going to get you any more money for them, and I think it takes about twice as long to ship. So yeah, but I have a strong opinion. If they're really expensive shoes, Nikes that, in the box. Yeah, get yeah. authenticated. If they're in, if they're in a box as well, if they're new with box, and we'll ship those in a box. But anything that's authenticated, we try to ship. Yeah. yeah. Normally, I would possible. say eighty to eighty-five dollars and under. It's going in a poly bag. Yeah. So. Yep. For me, it's the same. It's I do like fifty dollars and under. If it's fifty mm -hmm. or less, it just goes in a bag. I don't sell a ton of shoes. Same boat as you guys. I just scaled back on it. Uh, they're more expensive where I source, and it just takes me a little bit longer to process them. The and cleaning. I'm very picky. I don't pick any oh. up that need any cleaning, other than just mm -hmm. if, it, if I can clean it less than ten seconds, I'll pick it up. Yeah. That's like my rule. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, but poly bag shipping for shoes, I think, is underrated. If you were a hardcore shoe seller and you were trying to get repeat clients and you had a large shoe inventory, I could see why having a better presentation might be a little bit uh, mm. have some have some more value there. But for yeah. us, where we're just kind of cherry picking the shoes as we're deep diving into clothing, um, realistically, we're not going to get many repeat buyers in that category. So I'm just trying to get the most cost effective thing, and I haven't had any you know complaints about it yet. Um, and once again, like if it's expensive, of course, I'm going to send it in a box. So that kind of negates anybody that would really be complaining about Good it. Good question. Yep. Christian's wife just got home. That's why we were looking over there. <laughs> Hi, Christian's wife. Hey. She's hiding. I, I, I said, hey, but I'm not his wife. Why, why are you talking to oh, my wife? Know. I, sorry. You're just the bunk buddy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. AJ says, I have about four to five Goodwills in my area for my route that are good. My question is, when should I branch out and travel further? I think when you need more items, if you're able to supply your business with four to five Goodwills and it's in a like time effective and cost effective and you're finding good stuff, I, I would just keep rolling with that. And then maybe like every once in a while, just go on like an experimental trip. Like I've done that. I go on a day, like Sam worked ahead a little bit. I'll just go to stores I've never been to. I'll drive a little bit further and check it out. And every once in a while, I'll add those into a future route. And a lot of times I go to it and it's like, okay, I'm better off where I already go. And then I don't have to think, should I, I don't know, maybe it's good. I just go. And then you don't have to answer that question. Yeah. If you're uh, wanting to grow and you're, we came at a point where we were like, why aren't we growing anymore? We were doing 30 a day at that point. And it was, we were selling 30 and listing 30 each. So we weren't growing Yeah. and it was kind of like, all right, now we need to buy more stuff. And that's where it kind of came into finding more places to another, go. So. Another bit of advice on finding new places to source, um, talk, make friends with the people at the stores that you visit frequently and ask them if they know of any places that have good deals in your area. We have found so, uh, several sources that way just by talking to people that you see all the time. Like you'll, there'll be regulars at the stores you go to. You'll see every time. Uh, make friends and talk to them and try to find out where they're shopping besides the places that you are. Um, and that's another way to find more sources. I was at the thrift store the other day and I saw one of the regular resellers that I've kind of befriended over the last while. And he actually told me about a coupon that was on their social media page they posted just that morning and I hadn't seen it. And so that saved me $10 on my order just because one of my oh, yeah. you know people that I've met at the thrift store let me know what was going on. And nice. I just had coffee with another person that I met at the thrift store 
uh, yesterday. Uh, he's moving and is going to be potentially liquidating some inventory in the next few months. And it's somebody that I know has a really good eBay store and a really good business and really knows what they're looking for. And, you know, of course, it's probably not going to be all things that I would grab, but, you know, those connections can really go a long way. It's your big bulk buy. There it is. <laughs> what niche brand of clothing do you love finding when outsourcing? So what's mm -hmm. one like brand if you see it you're just like giddy gloria vanderbilt no i <laughs> just kidding. i love finding like the the cool has been bashing that brand and all his i, know, all I, I his did that videos. for Bo. <laughs> yeah we uh i like finding cool golf brands like uh malbin we found malbin the other day bad birdie stuff like that's pretty cool but the uh the classic you find an arcteryx that's like new or something that's pretty cool to find uh, my favorite brand to find is keton uh, if you ever see that really good it's a blazer yeah like a sport coat i got a i did have a small buy of keton ties that i yeah. uh, sold over oh, the last ties? year really? yeah, they still do well for sure yeah <clears throat> okay my mine like i i definitely have like had like a little like Part thing the both both times I found a rowback polo. Oh yeah, yeah, um, rowback exactly. one because that's just like money in the bank right there. Yeah. Um, but Patagonia is like a soft spot for me because it's just my favorite like brand personally. So even though it's not even that good of a brand anymore, I just Patagucci. I still oh. like, bro. I was waiting on somebody to say. It. I was waiting on either you to say it or him to say it. I didn't know which one. They got beef. There was beef. <laughs> World yeah, Pat a smoochie. Pat a, there you go. That's better. <laughs> Tam says, how do you respond to extremely low offers, like 80% off or more? I just send like a really minorly discounted offer. Like if it's, say it's listed at $100 and they send a $20 offer, I'll just send a $95 offer and then let it be. Well, Same right. thing. Yep. We send the middle finger emoji. No, we don't. <laughs> we are good Christian young men. We just send another offer back. Same thing. Honestly, the the engagement in the algorithm is honestly a positive thing. So if you change your mindset from this person's annoying me to this person is helping my eBay store, then, you know, you can save that mental headache. Do both. They are still annoying you, but just respond. You got to yeah. do it. As part AJ it. says, do you ever disregard or redonate old clothes that don't sell? If so, how long do you wait? Do you guys have a process on that? Um, I don't think we've ever done that. I think we just throw them away. No, we either we it doesn't happen very often. So what we'll do is just list it cheap. We'll relist it, like take it down, take it out of stock, redo the photos, redo the titles and everything, and then just if it's really bad, normally it's not um, because the item was bad. It's because it had flaws, like like the brand. It's not because the brand's bad. It's like it had holes or it had stains. I'll just drop the we'll just drop the price to like eight, nine, ten dollars or something, and then just hope somebody buys it. But we have the space. Yeah. So, and it's weird how often stuff with flaws sell. So for us, even if it's $5, we got $5 back rather oh, than Oh, I read, I read this question. Did I talk about if it just doesn't sell, what do we do with it? That's the question. Oh crap. Yeah. I read that wrong. Well, um, we hard. do read, we do relist a lot of stuff. So we'll pull it and redo all the pictures, title and everything. I just said, I'm sorry. Jeez, yeah. I'm I have not that. personally had to redonate any clothes. Um, but I do have some that are probably old enough that I, I probably should at this point. Um, but I, I'm luckily, luckily, like my, my brain says if it's a bad item and I can sell it for two dollars plus shipping, I will sell it for two dollars. So I've ran really aggressive markdowns on my oldest stuff. Like if it's over a year old at this point in my store, that's before I knew what I was doing. Is just kind of mm -hmm. how I think about it. So I literally put that stuff at eighty percent off which that means some of these items are only starting listed at 20 bucks. So 80% off is like nothing. And if they send me a $2 offer, I just accept it. And I take my dollar and I get it out. You know, oh, that's smart. But I haven't had to redonate anything yet. So yeah. uh, like I said, probably some of those I, I could, they might yeah, yeah. You know, not ever sell, but I, because my sell through rate is high in my store, I don't really go back looking for that stuff because I'm not in a space problem. I'm not in a cash flow problem. So if it ever came to that point, I'd go back and look at it. But that stuff, I just don't even really mess with it. Just discount it. 
yeah, like I said, we have the space to hold it, so we're not really worried about it too much. Ed says, what percentage of your business is Amazon, and have you guys left Amazon completely? I still had some carryover sales from Q4 in January, but as of right now, 0% of my business is on Amazon. I This upcoming Q4, if I see things that are just going to be no-brainer, easy money, I'm not going to, like, I'm going to leave my account active and I'm still willing to sell on there. Uh, but last year I made so little based on how much gross sales I did on Amazon that I realized this is really just not worth my time uh, based on other things that I'm doing business-wise. You want me to answer this? <laughs> uh, we have currently have a bunch of Amazon products that we have not put on Amazon yet. So we're sitting on, I don't even know, fifteen twenty thousand dollars worth of inventory that we've not listed on amazon that we really need to get on so uh we will be on amazon soon hopefully we get that stuff on but as of right now zero it's not clothing though so no, it's, it's not, none of its clothing it's a completely different business that yeah. we were doing before clothing yeah and now it's just sitting yeah, so <laughs> yeah. we have to do it. it's just the, the reselling takes up so much of our time that it's hard to do the other thing but we'll get there Katie says, my y'alls are fine. Appreciate nice. it. <laughs> what about y'all? What about y'all? <laughs> Michael says, my wife has family in Ohio, so I'll hit y'all up if we're there. Cleveland is where we'd be closer. So you guys have to come up to me because I'm like 45 yeah. minutes to an hour from Cleveland. That's checkmate. Darn. Yeah, we're, we're, we're a little... reseller meetup. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we can make our – I have friends in Cleveland, so we might be able to head up there. And, not, yeah, and Caleb. Caleb's there too, so we can – that's another friend. Uh, Traymon says, how many stops do you guys make a week for sourcing? Mm. Uh, like, yeah, it's a lot. Um, our big day is on Thursday where we normally go like, what, like six, seven, eight, nine stores. It depends on how, like how much we've got. So if we, if we hit our 540 and the car's full, we'll kind of, you know, meander back home. But, uh, if we don't get the five. Forty, we keep going to stores. So I don't mean how many until is, completion. Of, how many is it normally? I'd say six to ten at the most. Yep. Yeah, I I do three on Thursdays, and those are like bigger stores where it takes me a lot of time to go through all the items. So yep. I would say that's the equivalent of probably like eight to ten stores. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't know if you guys would co-sign that. Like no, yeah, for sure. Uh, with some of the we, bigger we, stores that you guys go to. Yeah, yeah, so with the two of us, and then especially on Thursday, our mom goes with us because she likes to shop and she likes to find stuff with us. Um, so we have three people going through a store, which really helps, which, yeah. rather than just one. So it goes, it goes quick. So, and we do Thursday. We do have a couple of big stores like you do that it takes a while to go through. So, yeah, so I do three stores, but I would say it's more like eight to ten the equivalent, like I'm outsourcing all, all day on Thursdays. And then I have right. smaller stores that I hit every single, like every single day that I work. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'll go to one of those stores when they open. Cause here they don't do much stocking during the day. They usually just stock yeah. in the morning and then it's just whatever it is. And if you go at noon, there won't be anything there. Um, so that's kind of my current strategy. When I was a few weeks ago, I was having a hard time hitting my uh, sourcing goals. So I started going like I probably hit 20 stores in a week. And I honestly didn't really. I would have had to go to a different town or completely switch it up if that was going to be my weekly norm, because it really is depending on your thrifts. It might not be valuable to just drive around all day and hit store after store, depending on when they stock uh, yeah. all of the stores in my area stock in the morning. So me hitting the store the 10th store at two o'clock in the afternoon when they stocked at nine, it's not really going to help me that much. Yeah. For sure. Tam says who has to keep the other in check more? Mm. Oh, it's him for sure. I have to keep you in check. No, I have yeah. to keep you in check. No. Yeah. Tony's bad. When we were, no, it was, when we were little, it was the other way around. He was, he was mean to me physically. He would, oh. he would beat me. I mean, he's, he's what are we on Dr. Me. Phil? Yeah. So it was, I'm more of a mental warfare kind of guy. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm not prepared for this level of counseling guys. That is a great yeah. question. All right. I think you do fine. <laughs> Wendy says, do you, 
end listings and sell similar. I have limited space and under 500 items. So you guys were saying you actually take the items off of eBay and re-photograph the items. Uh, so we do both. Items, right? We we do okay. both. Actually. Well, we just started. Depending doing on it. how old it is. Yeah. So we just started doing the sell similar um, because, I mean, we, we saw other people and how it does work for them. So we were um, tempted to try it at least. But with as many items as we do have, it was kind of it, it was kind of difficult. But we're just going to try to do it and see how it works. Um, but if it's a really old item, we'll do that, take it down and just redo everything kind of situation. So I'm experimenting with that kind of stuff for older items. Um, like I said, I don't really have a problem with having super old items most of the time. So it's not like something that's at the top of my list to really focus on. But as I'm going to be accepting less offers, I realize my sell through rate's going to go down and those items might miss the algorithm and get buried especially like you know you might have a really good item in polo ralph lauren for example but that cat that brand is just so dense on ebay if you don't take an offer or get it sold within a couple months you know you could be so far deep on those results you, you couldn't find it if you tried you could type in your exact title and not find yeah. um, the item and so on those types of items you are going to have to get creative with how to get those sold if they get buried yeah and we we have very lofty uh, listing goals a day so it's kind of um we run out of time after doing that and doing our shipping and doing everything that we do during the day so it, that normally gets pushed to the back burner unfortunately moochie says do you guys cross this between mercari and poshmark yes, i do. just as of today took all my listings off poshmark <gasps> r.i.p all right, Peter Bye. Poshy. Bye, Poshy. But I'm planning to put them all back on Poshmark. Oh, um, man, what a <laughs> what a roller coaster! I, know. I, I just want to take you guys. I wanted to take you guys on the ride there. Yeah, my goodness. Um, oh. what, what what was happening was with experimenting with what when Wendy was asking about with doing some of the selling similar and moving items around and trying different discounts and things like that. Uh, the software was not agreeing and recognizing all those items and matching them up. So I was having a little bit of a problem with items selling on multiple platforms and all that kind of stuff. And oh, yeah. I wanted to find a way to do that cleaner. And so until I can find a way to do that cleaner, I just don't, I don't think it's really that big of a deal, especially if you're not canceling on eBay because they're the only platform that really punishes you for it. But yeah. it's for me, it's more the mental taxation. It's the distraction aspect. It's the frustration aspect when you go to find an item and you're looking in mm. the box that it should be and it's not there. And then you're like, wait, did I mix up one of the numbers? I got to go look at the photos. When was it listed? I'll, oh, I was at this SKU at the same time that item was. And it just that whole process i just want to eliminate that from my brain so until i can find a system that doesn't involve that mental taxation um ebay is where i make my money so i'm just going to stay focused on there and keep adding other things in when it becomes convenient and streamlined but right now it's a little too spread out to keep cross-listing for me yeah we do we sell on poshmark and macari <laughs> as well we have in a um like you said, I mean, we, we have ran into some problems of um, double sales, but it's always on Poshmark and Macari, not on eBay for the most part. So um, it's not the worst thing in the world. Obviously, you don't want it to happen, but yeah. uh, and it's few and far between. So it's not like it happens all the time. So um, take a sale when we can, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we got one more question. Let's hit it quick, and then let's um, jump into some part-time versus full-time because I know there's some people in here that are you know, here specifically for that. Do you guys do any retail arbitrage? I do if I'm near one of near a store where I do retail arbitrage, um, but I don't really purposely go out of my way for it currently. If I were to do uh, new item sourcing right now, it would probably be more online arbitrage just because of the time-saving aspect. Uh, we do a little bit of retail arbitrage, but I'd say 95% of our stuff is all thrifted. Yeah. Perfect. <clears throat> so talking about part-time versus full-time, that was, that was a great, yeah, uh, was I, great. Like that. I like answering questions. Yeah. Um, we kind of talked about how each of us started a little bit different, but just to kind of rewind the clock, you know, if you were a beginner watching this video, 
like would give you give somebody like a layout of how you would start a reselling selling business if you started today as a part time reseller. They always say start with your own closet. So get all the stuff that you have that you don't wear or that you think might sell. List it first, and if you're able to do that successfully, move on to spending your own money, and then kind of move on from there and uh, see if you can be profitable. Uh, know your numbers. Know how much money you have to spend and uh, make sure you keep really good track of your numbers along the way. Mm, that's pretty good. Um, I mean, what can I say other than that? Um, no, I mean, I think that's pretty, watch a lot of YouTube and watch people like, like Caleb and don't watch it. I'm just kidding. You can watch us if you want to, but um, yeah, watch people that know what they're doing and, and have been doing it for a while and, and learn Definitely. from them. But um, stay, trying to improve so just because we say something doesn't mean that it's our final product um if you find something that works better for you it's faster um do it try it out um and uh, like don't said, overthink yeah um, yeah just go at um i want to say go at your own pace and do what you have to do but um at the same time if your, your goal is to make it full time give it all you got you should be having fun when you start off it shouldn't be I'm running this sweatshop yeah. business that's super stressful because I got to hit my goal, my listing target. I mean, yeah. when you start off, it should be something that you enjoy to do. And if you enjoy it, then you scale from there. Yeah, but don't don't jump in, especially if you're part, trying to be part-time. Don't jump in full throttle like we did because you can get into some trouble quickly. Unless you have like a situation is where you have a lot of extra money laying around. But um, that's not the case for a lot of people. So no. I wouldn't jump in uh full throttle crazy you know go slow you know you're going to make mistakes you're going to learn um if you're going slow it's, the mistakes are min uh, minor instead of oh i can't pay my mortgage or oh, i i don't have any money in my savings account or something so yeah that's what i would for go sure. i would build slow for sure yeah the two things i would add to that are start in categories where you already have interest and you already have some base knowledge. Like I mentioned golf clubs, like I don't really specialize in golf clubs, but because I golf, I know what the good brands are and I know what I'm looking for. And you can tell the difference between a newer model and an older model and you know, the kind of the knockoff brands and what are like the premier name brands, but that could apply to any category. If you like grew, grew up playing video games, you kind of know what would be good in that category. I mean, that's, oh, yeah. A little bit difficult category to jump into, um, but just kind of using your own personal interest to kind of guide where to start. And then I would also really, really, really recommend uh, if you're part time, I think sell through rate is even more of an important stat, which is something I knew nothing about until, you know, the last year or so in my business. And what sell through rate is, is just comparing the data on eBay, how many items are listed versus how many items have sold in the last 90 days. And what you're kind of doing there is you're taking a small sample of the market and looking at the supply and demand. How many listed is the supply and how many sold is the demand for that item? And you can kind of determine how likely you are to sell that item uh, within you know 90 days or so. And the more uh, sold versus the listed items available, the faster that your item is going to sell. And I think focusing on that from the beginning uh, is going to keep your cash flow high, which is something we talked about at the beginning of this uh, kind of, I don't even know what you call this, this live show. Um, and that's both really, that's important to both of our businesses, having good cash flow through our business. And I think having a high sell through rate when you're part time and you're not already rolling with sales coming in, you have mm -hmm. to be moving items quickly to get that money back to reinvest into your business. Yeah, um, sure. So that's the most important thing for me when I'm talking to somebody that's just starting out um, would be focus on sell through rate. Great advice. Yep. That's why you're the professional. Yeah. <laughs> so as far as scaling towards full time, I think that's kind of where a lot of these other questions come in. I think let's just knock off a couple of the uh, very common questions. Um, what do you guys do for saving for your retirement? Because a lot of employers are helping you with saving for retirement. And mm -hmm. what are you guys doing for health insurance? Because that's another, you know, very common question for us full-time resellers. It's a great question. You want to go? Health insurance. My wife is a teacher. I'm on her health insurance. Uh, thank the Lord. Um, and for saving for retirement, uh, I just save as much money as I can and uh, live below my means. Uh, that's all I have right now. I'm sure. That's I, not true. He has some. 
some stocks and, and stuff. That well, I have some investments. Yeah, yeah some investments say. and stuff. But yeah, yeah nothing that is. Uh, I was going to say Bitcoin. I have some Bitcoin. but <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He, he has Bitcoin. He has gold. He has silver. He has all kinds of things. I bought Bitcoin when it was at $1,400. Lucky fella. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I also, my wife is also a teacher. Uh, so um, hopefully she might be able to quit sometime soon if she wants to. But at this point, she doesn't want to. So she's still teaching. So that's where. But I've heard things where um, you can get insurance. Um, oh, I forget what they're called. They're like Christian organizations where you can pay a certain amount a month. And um, as long as you're it's not some like scandal that you have where it's crazy, they'll they'll help you out a lot. So it's more affordable that way. It's not 100 percent. I mean. It's like 99% guaranteed, but some of the, I mean, you never know for sure, 100%, but it can be expensive. So I understand that for sure. My wife was very weary of quitting because of the whole insurance thing. But same thing as um, being debt free. Uh, we, we, we Neither one of us have car payments. Neither one of us um, have anything outlandish uh, spending wise that we that we do every month or every day or whatever. Um no expensive so, yeah, hobbies yeah. Living, living under your means and just safe investments and doing stuff like that so yeah it is a little sketchy to you think about retirement and stuff but uh most people um, that's why you try to make more money than you need yeah really yeah. it seems like most people don't uh think ahead like that they, they can be house poor car poor you know do a whole lot of stuff where they get themselves in trouble um if you're trying to be a reseller i have a feeling that that is not your nature in general so you're yeah. more cautious yeah. as a whole um about money because in, in all honesty this could go away today it could go away tomorrow you never really know for sure something can happen that you don't foresee so uh being smart with your money and having a a backup plan on a backup plan in case like if something were to happen to to me or my wife's job like we have months out in advance of being able to be okay yeah. so that we can uh, figure out what we want to do next. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's, I can't really think of anything else. That's that. all I got. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So one thing I would add for the insurance piece is that you can actually just go and purchase health insurance. Uh, it's not the most affordable oh, yeah. thing ever. Um, and it also is the price of your insurance is scaled based on your income. So especially as you're building your business on paper, um, you're probably not gonna be showing huge gains at the beginning of your business. And so you can actually get very affordable health insurance just purchasing it uh, outright. <clears throat> Once again, we're not financial advisors. This is just our personal yeah. experience of being full-time resellers. And as far as retirement, like it, you don't have your employer um, paying into your retirement, but you are your own employer. So you need to be paying into your own retirement. And that could look like a million different things. Uh, it starts out with you know, maybe just putting it into a savings account and then talking to a financial advisor, what would be a good um, retirement asset for me as a self-employed person? And there's tons of ways to do that. I'm not even going to get into it because I wouldn't be the expert to talk about it. Um, right. But it is a sacrifice because when somebody else is paying into your retirement or matching your retirement savings or whatever that case may be, that is very, very, very valuable. I don't want to take away from that at all. But yeah. the one beautiful thing about being self-employed is I could potentially have a 30% raise on my income next year. There's mm -hmm. no job where you can get a 30% income raise on your salary you know, within reason, there will be exceptions to the rule, of course, uh, maybe in sales oh, yeah. or something like that. Um, but generally, you're not able to increase your income dramatically. Um, if I'm able to increase my income by 30%, then I can probably put more into my retirement than just putting in 4% of my paycheck and having my employer match it. Um, but in most jobs, you don't have the opportunity to earn more than your salary or whatever they cap you out at or uh, those types of things. So um, just kind of a little thing that I like to think about when it comes to retirement It is my responsibility it does take a lot of discipline, um, but you actually could be saving more for your retirement because you can increase your income on a more exponential level being self-employed and it's not up to somebody else what you make. Yeah. And, and like you said, what are you trading that? retirement for because like you said we can still do that and, and and figure out a way to to have a retirement and to still like you said even make more but 
I'm trading that for the freedom of being my own boss and being able to do things, hang out with my daughter during the day instead of having to be strict of, oh, I have to, I have to do this work right now. I'm going to get fired situation. So I don't know. You just, I mean, it's just, there's pros and cons to all of it. And like you said, I mean, our sales are up 40% from last year. So, I mean, you're not going to get a 40% raise at your job unless you're moving up positions quite a while. So, I mean, it's a great point that, yeah, your income can go up based off how hard you work. And so if you save that same 4% that your employer is matching, but you increase your income by 40%, you could yeah. actually be saving, you know, even more without hurting even your own personal finances. Yeah. Um, and then another thing you mentioned was like an emergency fund as well. And I would definitely recommend that if you are part-time wanting to take the leap to full-time, uh, you know, maybe three to six months of your personal expenses, like knowing exactly what it costs you to live your current lifestyle is extremely important because that's kind of the number that all these other numbers are going to revolve around when it comes to your own personal finances and going full-time. Uh, if you have months and months in uh, reserves as an emergency fund, you know, it's not as risky to, to take the leap full time. But if you are needing every single payout from eBay to pay bills immediately, um, there's a lot more on the line when it comes to reselling and being a full time reseller. Yeah, for sure. Depends on what you are, too. We can take risks with money uh, differently than somebody that's 65 can take. If they want to make an investment of all their money, I mean, they could be down and out and so many lose, factors. lose everything. So we're, many I mean, factors. we're 29 and 30 years old. We, we have a lot of time to recoup any lost funds if there's any horrible thing that happens. So you can be a little, depends on how old you are. There's a lot of different factors. Yeah. Good question. For sure. And then one thing uh, kind of around this topic that I want to throw out there, it's a little equation that I've used to answer this kind of question, like how much money do you need or how many sales or how many listings or whatever else. It really comes down to how much profit you're making for your business. And that profit needs to outweigh your personal expenses plus what you need to save, whether that's for retirement or just for your own personal savings. And it also needs to exceed what you spend on inventory for that allotted period of time. Um, because if you have enough to pay your expenses, it might seem like all is good in the neighborhood. But if you don't have that money to go out and reinvest in inventory, uh, our sourcing in our inventory is the lifeblood of any reselling business. If you can't go out and buy your 540 items, you're immediately on a downward trajectory. Yep, uh, if I can't go out and afford the 140 items that I we I need every week, uh, I can't do my listings and I can't make the money that's needed to have the cash flow for my business. Um, so I think a lot of people overlook that it's not how much you make if it matches your current salary. So say you make $3,000 profit reselling and you currently make $3,000 for your salary from your job in a month. It might seem like, okay, I'm great, but you still need that additional money to go out and purchase the inventory to keep making 3000 mm -hmm. or that number is going to start declining. Absolutely. It's a lot to think about. It's a big decision to do for sure. Absolutely. And I think we've already kind of talked about like sourcing routes and stuff like that as well. But if you are looking to make full time, uh, the jump to full time, I would recommend figuring out like what a daily or weekly or monthly listing goal would be and what that would uh, cost you based on your average cost of goods and kind of factoring in that number of being able to afford it. But also sometimes you're already getting the items that you can that are in front of you. So if you're working towards full time, you might need to take a week and say, I'm going to try and source my full-time amount of items this week and see if it's even possible within the amount of time that I have. Yeah. For sure. um, does that kind of make sense? I feel yeah, like we were, I was a little scatterbrained there. No, I got you. Cause it, we were talking off the stream. It was um, say, Oh, I'm a part-time. So I delegate two or three hours a day to this and I, I make an extra $2,000 a month. Well, if I quit my job and put another eight hours a day into this, I can make a ton of money. That's not necessarily the case. Cause if you don't know what you're as available in your area and how much stuff you can get, I mean, yeah, that's not necessarily going to go from two or three thousand to eight, nine, ten thousand. Maybe you don't have that much stuff in your area and you're only stuck at, I can only make three or four thousand a month, but I need eight for all my expenses and everything that I live live on. So, I mean, it's like you said, doing a test run and uh, not just one week, but multiple weeks throughout to be like, OK, yeah, this is possible for me to do. Um, because like you said, it, it's a big, it's a big decision that can really affect you and your family's life. Yeah.
for sure. Absolutely. So just like to kind of recap that, I do feel like I was a little over the place there. Say you need 100 items a week for your part-time listing goal, but you want to go full-time and you the income based on your metrics and everything, you need 200 items per week. What I'm saying in this particular point is, can you get 200 items in a week in a reasonable amount of time? Because yeah. it might require going to a different city, finding new sources, building um, networking relationships with suppliers and all those things to get double the amount of items. Uh, yeah, you could process it. Yeah, you know what to look for and all those things. But if you're not able to find those in a reasonable amount of time, um, that's going to be the thing that kind of chokes off that transition from 100 items to 200 items. And you might have to adjust what you're buying. I mean, if you're part time, you might only want $20 profit items. Yeah. But if you're full time and you're trying to scale a decently sized business, you might have to go to ten dollars profit yeah. per item. So. Or you try to do video games and they just don't have enough video games for you, and you might have to figure out another item to throw in there as well. But I know we're making this sound really scary. That you it's, can't, it's literally you impossible. Can't, nobody can sell on eBay ever, but it's it's there. Trust me, it's it's you can definitely do it still for sure. Well, and I think like if you have that mindset. And then you go out and you can source 200 items in a week, then that's a comforting feeling. Like the thought of it is scary if you've never done it. But if you try for three or four weeks to say, okay, I'm going to see if I can do 200 items in a week and you can do it for three or four weeks, that actually would be more comforting than scary because you oh, yeah. know that it's actually possible. So yeah, it's yeah. more just like things to think about. I don't think any of the things we've talked about are necessarily pros or cons. It's more like this is what you need to consider and having the right mindset going into it could save you a lot of headache or heartache yeah, <laughs> down yeah, the line. For sure. for and you'll learn, you'll learn, you'll learn new brands and find new stuff. And all of a sudden it'd be like, it's impossible to find a hundred. Then it's like, okay, yeah, find a hundred is pretty easy. I have learned all these new brands to make it way easier to find a hundred. Now it's like, okay, now I got to get to 200. So it's, you learn, I mean, there's so many brands that I know oh, now gosh. that I have no idea what it was before. So it's, it's two years in we're still novices as far as brand knowledge. Awesome. Okay, let's check uh, check in on the chat here and answer some questions. Traymon says, do you promote? I promote all my items at 5%. We do 10. Well, sorry, 8 to 10. It's a variable one. It seems like it ends up being 10 a lot more than it does 8, but I don't know. What yeah, yeah, the recommended yeah. promotion on this item is 17.9%. <laughs> yeah, weird how that works. <laughs> um, e says, do you guys ever go to auctions or estate sales? I do if I'm driving by one and it's open, I'll, you know, I might swerve in or every once in a while I'll check the websites that have the estate sales posted. And if I see one that's like maybe really juicy with clothing, then I, you know, might make it a point to check it out. Uh, but it's not currently really in my sourcing rotation. Uh, we do not, but we actually might uh, this year. We're probably going to check some out. Uh, not sure how that's going to go, but we're definitely interested in checking them out. But we have not as of yet. Yeah, we don't know how Ohio is with that. We know like Florida places like that are good for it, but I guess we'll see. <laughs> K&M asks, Resale Bros, what are your, what's your sell-through rate cutoff? 50%? Question mark? I'd say, yeah. Yeah, we shoot for 50%. Now, if there's... I mean, there are weird things with the eBay search where we've sold stuff that it's way higher than 50% in our store and it shows 40 or 30% on eBay. Yeah. And that's where knowing your store comes into uh, effect of knowing what sells for you and your store. And I don't know if that's just a weird eBay thing with their. Also, their where you search. promote is another factor. I mean, if you're in a 30% sell through rate, but you're promoting at 10%, yours. It might be 60% so through a 10% promotion. So yeah. there's a bunch of factors. Cost also. Also, if it's 50 cents, am I going to really, and it's 30% sell through rate versus 50, am I going to really complain a lot? It's 50 cents, you know? But 50% so. 50, 50 is definitely a good cutoff. Yeah. We just have our store, like you said, 11,000 items. Um, sometimes we have to buy some stuff that maybe K&M wouldn't buy. But it will eventually sell for us uh, nine times out of ten. Some stuff that we buy that normal people don't pick up, uh, it does end up selling. So generally, though, fifty percent is normally yeah, where that's, we that's where number. we sit for sure, for sure. And I think you made a good point about the cost of the item as well, because um, if you search on eBay using like the price um, little filter mm -hmm. there, like an item 
under ten dollars is going to have a way higher sell through rate than an item um priced at twenty dollars the exact same item and so if you have 50 cents or a dollar into that item maybe you're listing at 20 bucks but maybe the market price is like 25 um, but on a saturated brand you might need to take 15 to 20 to get that sold within a three month six month time period um, but when you're paying a dollar or two dollars you can afford to take that you know smaller uh profit per item yeah for sure Blue Acquisition says, do you guys think being top rated plus on eBay makes a huge difference in sales? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, huge. I, I don't know if I would say huge, but the main thing I think about it Accessing is return. Yeah. Uh, the um, the break you get in fees. What is it, like 10%? You get in oh, yeah, the, break. The, the That's a breaks. big deal yeah. for us. And then uh, we do think it helps some how much compared to what it used to. I mean, there's no way to tell for sure with eBay and the algorithm and stuff. but um, I don't think it could hurt. So why, why not give it a go? Especially if you can ship out every day, like we do and take returns, our return rate is only two to 5% uh, average on something. I mean, on 11,000 item store. So it, it seems like it could be something that is, Oh, I don't want to get it a lot of returns, but I mean, if you watch our last video, I no mean, lie. Anyway, we, they want to return yeah, it. We had something that sold two or three times already because it doesn't fit right for people, but eventually it's going to stick. So the returns do sell again. So I don't know. Yeah. I think that's like one thing that I kind of struggle with because I do ship Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I kind of go back and forth if I wanted to ship every day so that I could be top rated plus. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I could have a, if my storage was on site, I would for sure do it. Um, my storage unit's only like 10 minutes away, but it's far enough that like if I'm trying to make it to thrift stores to be the first person or if I want to hit my normal sourcing That's routes tough. because yeah, I'm yeah. my only person, like yep. one of you guys could ship while the other person's the first person in the door and then Which you can catch up later. Yep. Yeah. And so for me, I just haven't really wanted to sacrifice being the first in every thrift store because yeah. a lot of the times I'm getting my shipping done in the afternoon. And like I said, I don't have a reliable pickup. Um, to yeah, so you know, that say, you picks up to, every three o'clock or whatever. Yeah, you have to go to the post office, which throws a wrench in everything. So I have to do two yeah. trips. I have to go to storage. I would have to go to storage every day, and I'd have to go to post office every day. And it just is enough of a distraction that for me, like the, the ten percent in fees is just a cost of me having a more streamlined operation. For sure. Laura says, my husband works for a small company and I resell part time along with some other odd jobs. His insurance is shared high deductible plan called Sidera. Mm -hmm. Well, this is an ad. They should pay me for this. <laughs> 96 people are in are uh, getting this advertisement. If you're yeah. in the chat, 96 people, I think that's the most I've ever had in one of my lives. So definitely hit the thumbs up. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Huge shout out to the resale thanks, brothers uh, for being on their description or their links are in the description. Um, so yeah, just thankful that we're having a good turnout today. Yeah. Um, I figured Sidera should know that, you know, this is the, my best live stream so I can get paid out for this. Hey, we want um, to yeah, make the check yeah. out the resale brothers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she said it's worked well so far for our family of six. That's awesome. So yeah, there's different options out there. Yep. Uh, don't let it, don't let the fear of insurance be the only reason it is something to consider, but it's not the only reason to not be full time. Honestly. And I, I've heard things, hospitals will work with you too. I mean, if it's a major thing, you can talk them down and get big discounts. I mean, it's, it's not something that's like publicized a lot, but typical can, reseller trying to do talk down sure. to, Hey, insurance. he said there's deals everywhere you go. You, you just did. gotta ask. Same thing at the hospital. Uh, Moochie says they have you doing 40% more work, but won't be able to give you a pay raise at a nine to five. So yeah, Absolutely. a lot of times your job, job description could change. Whereas if my job description changed, I would change it so that I'm making more money, not doing more work for less money or the same mm -hmm. money. Smart. Yeah. But also at the same time, you can't be your own worst employee. Christian said that in the last live we did. Christian pretty, yeah. Christian Evans, 2024. Um, yeah. So you got to work hard. Yep. Uh, Backwoods Pickers, uh, at Caleb, where do you get the boxes for inventory? I see sellers are getting away from totes. Can you share a little about, about organizing inventory? So me and Resale Brothers use a very similar, probably the same, other than one minor difference. They pre-bag in the poly bag, and I do a clear poly bag um, for the item. How do you and all the stuff is... 
I do my research. <laughs> um, I came prepared today, guys. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, anyway, <clears throat> the links for the stuff that I use specifically is in the description of this video. And if it's not in the description now, it will be when this turns into a uh, you know standalone video after the live is ended. So you can check that out and all the products I use will be in there. Um, but basically, in, in the tote version, if you sell the item that's on the bottom of the tote, or if you have your tote stacked on top of each other and you sell something that's in the bottom tote on your stack, that creates a lot more work and a lot more time. And say you are at scale, you have lots of items in your store. You might have, I might have three pairs of jeans that are Levi's 527s, 32 by 32. So it would be hard to know which one it is that sells because the whiskering could be different on this pair of jeans or the fade could be different on this pair of jeans or one's vintage and one's not. And all those different nuances, instead of throwing it in a bin and having to figure that out later, I just have an individual number attached to every single item in my store. And so how it works is they're all filed in sequential order. <clears throat> So when you go to find your item, you go to the box that has that number in it and you're pulling out the specific item. Instead of trying to find the item within a bin, um, you're finding the specific SKU number to that specific item. So it's much easier to find your specific item and you can actually store a lot more items in the same amount of space that way as well and do less lifting of the bins. And I hope that was a good explanation. Um, that's the best I could do off the top of my head. You guys have anything to add to that? We do the same thing. Yes. <clears throat> Jem says, do you promote listings or do dynamic promoted? Okay, so I do 5% five across, five across the board, and it sounds like you guys do dynamic yeah, we up do to the 10%. Dynamic. Yeah, 8 to 10, yep. I drive an old Ford Escape. It has low miles, but it's old and ugly. <laughs> what car do you use for your business? Uh, I drive a an old Acura car that I got in college. So do uh, I. I'm very cheap, like I said. But actually, our mom has a nice electric car that we steal we sometimes. take to the, nice. to the store. So, yeah, no gas for us. Sometimes. I used to have a Tesla, but I sold it. Yeah. Canem Resale said, we're in the same boat 50% as well here and agreed completely on store. Charles Tierwitt. Terwitt, however you say that, I've always been confused about I that. hate it too. Don't it's ask. Right. Don't it's ask. Is 25 is 25% across the board, but 100% in our store due to our business model. Yep. That's so really having free returns, having all those things are going to compile into your store sell-through rate. So knowing yeah. your own numbers on these brands, the eBay sell-through rate is just a guide. It is just yep. a one tool. Uh, but doing the research on brands you find and sell often on your own store that's going to be uh, the most valuable data. Yeah, yeah. and shout out K&M. They did like $1,200 in their most recent what sold. So that's, I mean, for just two people, that's a pretty good number. Yeah, yeah we, uh, they're killing that, it. Yeah, that brand is literally, oh, I think if I had to pick an example for our store, that would be the brand. <laughs> that and the, maybe a couple of them, but Charlie T. Sean's in the house. Taylor Exchange is here. Another great uh, YouTube channel to check out. He says, what's up, Caleb? 19 likes with 92 watching. Hit the like button. Yeah, hit it. I agree. I'm going to hit it right now. I agree. I'll tell you what. His videos are very well produced, 100%. Yep. I really enjoyed his recent video about the reseller news. You guys were featured on there. That was pretty cool. Oh, nice. Um, it was just a kind of a fresh take. Um, just kind of yeah, doing it. a little chit chatting. It's kind of fun. Eastern Rose says, what kind of bag do you use for your inventory to store? So I'll talk about mine. It is a clear bag with a zip on the top. Um, the reason that I like to use the zip instead of the like little adhesive strip is just the trash and the adhesive strip thing is just very oh, annoying. So the zip Lord. just kind of saves uh, one little step there. And it's clear. One reason I use clear is so that I can double check the item without having to open it before I go to ship. Yep. So I'll let you guys talk about the benefits of doing it slightly differently. You, you want to do what we started with? <laughs> we've used like three different stuff. We started with the clear as well. And um, we've kind of the polyurethane, like really loud. Yeah. Ones, like you were talking about. Yep. Yeah. And then we went to the, were they zip or they yeah, were kind of like zip a, lock? Yep. Yeah. That and next. now, and now we uh, prepackage them and what we're going to ship them in 
uh, to save time when we go to ship the item. They're all ready to go in the bag. We just slap a label on and they're out the door. So we also had the thought of, man, we're not going to be able to check the item and see what's inside oh, yeah. it anymore. So we started writing like um, the initials of the product. So if it was um, Charles, uh, why did I pick that one? I don't know. It's a Char Charlie T. If it was that one again, we put CT on it. And then you look at it when you're picking it like, oh, Charlie T. Okay, CT. That makes sense. This should be what's in here. Um, we've never had a problem with sending the wrong item. So it's worked. You just need to find a marker that doesn't smear. Yeah. That's the main thing. That saved a lot of Got time. Yeah. I've really considered doing that, but like every once in a while, like I miss, I mess up a number when I'm typing it in and just being able to see through the bags is so nice because like now with 11,000 items, you're probably not finding that thing anyway. If you mess up the number, <laughs> <laughs> like on, honestly, honestly, yeah, if you mess yeah. up the number, it's probably not. Well, we include a picture of the skew in our listings as well. <clears throat> so we kind of have a little bit of a redundancy there. Yeah. But. Yeah. I don't have that redundancy. So I, I, would make that change if I switched over to the poly bags. Now that ground advantage cubic is so affordable, it is makes a lot more sense because mm -hmm. you're not deciding, oh, this should go in a flat rate. This should go in a padded flat rate. This should go oh, in a box. God, this yeah. should do this. So it's yeah. pretty much always in a bag for pretty much everything, you know, that we sell. And for the time that you save for the like maybe 5% of times where a flat rate might save you some money, you're just saving the time of just slapping the label, moving on to the next yeah. one. That's right around the time we made the, the change, I believe. Yep, exactly when we made the change. Tam says, I started this past September when I won $600 on a scratcher. That's there a good way go. to start. Yeah, that's the Lord. I jumped so all in to go. start my business. I currently have a 74% sell through rate. I think that's wow. excellent. That's Thanks great. for all the yeah. knowledge and support. It's better that's than great. Us. Man, Tam, you're killing it. Yep. Good job. Teresa Horn says, do you have suggestions for someone who's just getting started and only plan to sell personal items, not a business for now? Maybe after watching this video, you'll be inspired. <laughs> what videos do you recommend to watch before I get started? Um, I think we've mentioned quite a few channels throughout this, uh, throughout this live. Um, some people have popped in. Um, to say hello, you know, of course, I'm going to endorse Resale Brothers. They're here with me on the live. And, you know, I try to provide as much value as I can uh, in my videos. I think, um, you know, we did talk about what we would do if we were to start our businesses over again today earlier in the live. So if you're just now joining, uh, maybe rewind or go catch the replay and see what we would do if we were just starting today. Uh, but just for a little recap, I would say focusing on items that sell really fast. Once you get past your personal items, uh, you want to find items that sell really fast to keep that cash back in your pocket and not in random items. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, check out a channel called Ginger Marvin. They, uh, a lot of people have heard of them. I know she sells a lot of her kids clothes and a lot of her clothes still and they wear them and then get them off. So, uh, it's a, I think that's a good, uh, beginner channel, channel for beginners as well. So awesome. David says, do you guys have any have a flat price for shipping. Have you tried to ship USPS Ground Advantage? Almost all of my packages send USPS Ground Advantage right now uh, just because it's very affordable. And I do charge a flat shipping price based on the rough weight of the item. Um, I feel like that gives the buyer a good value now that the rates are affordable for us. I want to pass on part of that to the buyer because I want to have a competitive product, a competitive price, a competitive uh, all in price with the item and the shipping. Um, but I still do make about a dollar or more on every single item that I ship, um, even with the flat rate and having a competitive rate. Uh, so USPS ground advantage is definitely a good way to go because of that. How about for you guys? The exact, same exact same way. Same. Yeah, we have yeah. a flat uh, flat rate. If, if it weighs under a pound, it's $6.99. If it weighs over a pound, it's $8.99 just based off of We've shipped a lot of items, so we know the farthest it's going to go is California. And if it weighs under a pound, this is what it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. And if it goes to California and it's over a pound, this is what it's going to cost. So that's where that's how we got those numbers. I think most people do. Flat yeah, yeah. Shipping. And then we, um, oh, but yeah, most ninety percent now ground advantage. Do a lot of ground advantage, but 
So. It's really nice in the clothing category because the shipping is so so predictable, and that's one yeah. of the benefits of the clothing category. I would think if you were venturing out into more difficult items to ship, things that might have odd sizes or odd weights, I would recommend, especially if you're starting out, maybe doing calculated um, just to make sure that you don't get um, you know messed up on you know a weird rate or something that you know can't go or if you got to go to uh like hawaii or puerto rico or something for example and you can't use ups on something bigger uh usps is really going to charge you through the nose on those types of items yep <clears throat> okay we're almost we're almost caught up here Teresa says thanks what's the best way to handle returns what are your policies i do buyer paid returns and are you guys free returns we are free yes. free yep and they offer free returns. And so I think with used clothing, it's almost essential to offer returns because a lot of people are gonna be turned off by the fact that they are not able to return the item. So I just think it's almost a given with a used clothing store that you kind of need to have that on. Yep. Michael says, by the way, on the shipping topic, eBay just sent out emails saying on May 15th, they will be changing the rate the buyer sees or pays to the amount that we as sellers pay instead of the inflated prices. Hmm. Okay. Well, well, here comes another change, guys. <laughs> yay. I haven't checked yay. my email yet today. I have not either. <laughs> so there you go. All right. Well, I do want to wrap up, uh, but before we go, I do want to say um, we talked a lot about shipping and a lot about item storage, and I'm considering storing my items in poly bags. I do use gyro pack for my poly mailers, and I do have a code to save you guys a little bit of money, 10%. The code is Caleb, all lowercase, and the link is in the description if you do want to go ahead and do that. And I do, it does help out the channel a little bit. Uh, if you want to support the channel, that's a great way to do so. Um, do you guys have any final words for the people? Uh, I want to thank you for having us on, for sure. Yeah. Um, Caleb's a cool guy. Um, Real nice, definitely knows what he's talking about. So uh, you guys should definitely keep following him. Uh, K&M Resell, those guys are cool as well. Um, and, but yeah, just keep grinding. Um, if you're starting off and you don't really know where to start, like we said, start with your own stuff um, and move up from there. That would be my advice for the new reseller. Yeah, uh, man, the only thing I can think to say is one, well, thank you to not only That's Caleb, but to the, the people that, we have almost 2,000 subscribers now. That's kind of cool. We didn't think we'd get there as quickly as we did, but it's awesome. Um, and also, I mean, learn, try to keep growing and not just growing, but with uh, volume, but speed and getting faster and, and learning. This is a, uh, a pretty cool community, as uh, a lot of the people say, that um, you can learn a lot from a lot of people. So you and can have fun and enjoy it. Don't yeah. be overwhelmed. You had your time to talk. I'm sorry. Talk. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you're just going to have fun. And, and, and it, it, there might be some dark times where you think, man, am I really able to do this? Or when you're in that year of trying to become a full timer or, or it's like, man, is this, is this ever going to shift? Is this ever going to go? Am I ever going to make any decent money? Um, you can't do if it. If you keep going, I, I promise it, it'll work out. It'll keep going. But uh, you just got to work hard and, and be the best reseller you can be, I guess. I don't know. Just trying to keep talking until because I don't want this to end. <laughs> you I don't want to stop. All right, we're cutting them off. We're cutting them off. Pull the mic. Right. Pull the mic. We're gonna go <laughs> longest, longest, uh, longest podcast in YouTube history. Longest outro. Yeah, yeah. longest outro in YouTube history. Well, I really do appreciate you guys coming on here. Uh, if you're in here and you're not only already subscribed to them, definitely go to the description and subscribe to their channel. I want to really applaud you guys because. Uh, I've kind of teetered with the thought of going beyond just a solo operation for a long time. And when I think about it, I think about the headaches and the challenges and the frustrations that kind of come along with that. And I think that taking that step to almost beyond full time is a really difficult thing to do as a reseller because it is so much on our own shoulders. It's hard to start taking some of those things off and passing them to other people. And it takes that, it takes trust. It takes those kinds of things to grow bigger than just ourselves and make more money than just the transactions that you can do in a day. So I just want to applaud you guys for taking on that challenge and you guys are uh, crushing it and love to see your YouTube success as well. Uh, you know, so you definitely have my support. Um, checking out your okay. videos and all that. And I've learned a lot from you guys. So I really appreciate you guys coming on here and, and educating some of my viewers 
uh, yep. on things that have helped you guys. So I can't yep. say enough good things about uh, about you guys. So yeah, thank you. We'll get There's you on our next, hot one, our next hot ones challenge. Yeah, we'll you're work. invited. Can we'll you see up. how red I am already? Just from talking, <laughs> I'm it's gonna die. Oh, it was. <laughs> yeah, you'll you'll do great. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. All right, guys. Well, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below for my channel and for their channel and like the video before you head out. And if you're watching the replay, uh, leave us a comment with what your biggest takeaway was from part-time versus full-time. And we'll see you in the next one. Yep. See God bless.